All right, welcome to our Delivering the Difference uh, series of Demystifying IUL. And so today we're going to talk uh, about the first part of our, our five-part session, uh, Indexed UL Mechanics. We're going to go through a little bit of information about, uh, you know, what are some of the terms, what is IUL. This is kind of setting the table for Indexed Universal Life so that we can get into deeper steps uh, in the upcoming sessions. Just a few disclosures. Okay, today we're going to be talking about um, account options. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, rates, and we'll be talking about uh, crediting methods and buckets. Uh, so, uh, again, this is mostly the terms, understanding what caps and pars and things of that nature are. Uh, this is not going to get into the detail of how companies provide index credits or, 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 or things like that. So that is next week's session. I know everyone... Uh, we'll probably be really curious about that and because we always have questions about uh, getting further into depth, but today we're kind of setting the initial understanding of index too well, so we are all on the same page with terms and, and, uh, and kind of how and why it's designed as it is. So let's look at index universal life. Uh, index universal life is really like almost any other universal life policy. It's, it's got the same types of things. It's got the same flexibility. It's got the same uh, ability to uh, adjust premiums uh, or, or uh, adjust death benefit amounts. Uh, the real difference is that instead of just having a fixed account, which of course, Index Life has that too. The fixed account is just a, a fixed interest rate declared by the company and there's a, a guaranteed minimum. The only thing that really makes Index Universal Life different from a traditional UL is that it also has another type of crediting method, an indexed account, where the performance is tied to an underlying market index. Uh, that means the monies are not invested in that index or the company's not you know, investing in that index. The, the idea is that that underlying index is used to determine the interest rate that's credited. And the indexed account will have uh, some sort of limit on the upside There's in some way, and we'll talk about the different ways there could be limits, and a limit on the downside. And we're going to talk about how we can limit the downside. Uh, so essentially, with an index account, you're going to get interest rates or, or interest credits that might vary. Uh, they won't be uh, as stable as you might see in a fixed account. They're going to be a little bit higher, a little bit lower at times. So all things considered, index universal life is not all that scary, so to speak, in, in the sense that uh, it, it's just like a fixed UL. In fact, if you want indexed universal life to be just like a fixed UL, just put all the monies in the fixed account, and you've essentially got a fixed universal life product. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, allocations um, and, and fixed account requirements and, and what North American does. Um, mixing allocations. I, I said just a moment ago that you have the fixed account or the indexed account. You can mix and match back back and forth between those. Uh, so for example, the client may say, well, uh, I don't know if we want all of this allocated toward index selections. Can we put some of it toward the fixed account? Sure. Uh, so you could put like a 50% in the fixed account and 50% in the indexed account. Uh, I, that's very you know, common to have some sort of allocation like that if they want. Uh, you can certainly do it whatever percentage that the client would like. Uh, whether it's you know 99% and 1% or whatever, as long as they are 1% uh, um, increments. At, at some companies will have a, a requirement that some money goes into the fixed account. Uh, North American does not have any uh, fixed account requirement. You don't have to allocate any funds to the fixed account. It doesn't even have to go into the fixed account a, a, as a, as a holding account or, or sit there until the the next index sweep date. It you know we don't have to have any funds allocated to the fixed account. Um, if you don't want to. And, and with North American, we have a number of different index allocations. You can allocate between different index selections and the fixed account uh, uh, as, as uh, minuscule as 1% as increment. So can you, can you move funds between these accounts? We, we have a fixed account that has that fixed rate and the indexed account that has a, a rate that may vary with the movement of an underlying index. Can you move funds from the fixed account to an indexed account? Absolutely, you can. Uh, you can move funds from the fixed account to an indexed account any trading day of the year that you want. Uh, so, I mean, today is, uh, uh, what, February uh, 6th? And if the client had funds in their fixed account, they say, I want to move 
funds to the indexed account today. Uh, that's fine. You can do that and, and have uh, February 6th be your new starting day for that index segment. So monies from the fixed account can be moved to the indexed account anytime. Monies from the indexed account can be moved to a different index account or to the fixed account at the end of the index segment. So the index segment is a, a, a term that is how long of a measuring period do we have? And it's typically a, a one year measuring period uh, with North American, all of our index segments are one year. Um, so for example, if I started an index segment today, uh, it would be February 6th until February 6th of the following year. Um, and, and that's that one year period that we would use to measure the movement of the underlying index. So if I had started a segment on February 6th, I could not move funds out of that segment or to the fixed account until that segment matures um, on the following segment anniversary. So now let's let's move on to the next uh, topic here, rates. And here's where we start to get into some some terms. <clears throat> we have we have a, a participation rate, a cap rate, a spread rate and a floor rate. So now this is where people who are just really becoming more familiar and accustomed to index universal life, they see some of these terms and they go, whoa, we got all these different uh, things going on. What's going on? Um, these are just different methods of, of helping control uh, an, an index, either limiting on, on the upside, which, which you need to do in order to provide this bottom one here, the floor rate, which is a limit on the downside. So I'm going to go into each of these terms and uh, not all of them are necessarily going to apply at the same time on an index selection, but there are different index selections that may use different ones of these. So we're going to get into detail on what a participation rate, what a cap rate is, what a spread and, and floor rate are. And we'll go through some examples to better understand it. An index participation rate, or, or sometimes you'll hear a PAR rate, is the percentage of the index changed that is used to calculate that index credit. So, for example, if the index went up 10% um, and the client was in a 100% uh, participation rate, that means they participated 100% of the index change, then their credit would be a positive 10% matching the index. If the index went up 10% and the client was in a 80% participation rate, then the client would get 80% of that gain. And I'll, I'll go through an example here in a little bit. Um, the PAR rate is declared in advance for each segment. And once a segment starts, remember a segment is that one year measuring period from the beginning of an index to the end of an index period is typically one year. Uh, that's that measuring period of time. Once the segment starts, um, the participation rate cannot uh, change. It's locked in for that segment. So let's look at an example. This is just super theoretical. I'm only looking at participation rate. I'm not looking at caps or floors or anything else right now. Just thinking of the participation portion of it. And I and I realize people are saying, well, wait a minute, Tom. I thought cap, you know, it couldn't go down. We'll get into how, what makes it not go down in just a little bit. But let's look at. Uh, I've got a dark green market index and a light green the the policy index, the the par the par rate. And here I'm using 80%. So if the underlying index went up 8%, um, then the client, if they were strictly in the, the participation rate portion of this, uh, they would get 80% of that gain, uh, which is you know 6.4%. If the next year the index went up 17%, they'll get 80% of that, and, and then their number's here. And on the downside, and again, we'll get into more details here because some of you are probably already thinking ahead. Um, on the downside, if the market goes down, they would they would get 80% of the loss. Essentially, the idea of a par rate is you're getting 80% of the movement. Uh, and this is a way that um, companies design index universal life to uh, help control some of the costs that, that you don't get all of the underlying movement. So this is how a, a par rate works, and, and we're going to build on this in a little bit. Another method or different method of control that a company may have is called a cap rate. A cap rate is the maximum amount that the company can credit in a, in a given segment. And again, it's declared in advance for each segment. Um, and once the segment starts, the cap rate can't change. So if the, if the cap rate were 10% and the index segment starts and then 
cap rates change up or down, um, the client is still locked into that cap rate that they had until the segment is over. At the end of their segment, then the cap rate can change for the next segment. Uh, and there are some index selections that have no cap at all. Uh, so we have a possibility of having you know, an index segment that uh, selection that has no cap and, and only runs on, on, um, on a spread or, or a participation rate, for example. So let's look at, at cap rates as an example here. Again, we're going to go with our, our underlying theoretical market index, which is the dark green line. And then we'll look at a cap. And we'll, and we'll suppose in this example, the cap is 13%. And again, this is all theoretical. If the index goes up 8% in the first year, uh, is 8% within our 13% cap? Yes. Yes, it is. So that's fine. And credit 8%. The next year, the index goes up 17%. Uh, well, 17 percent is higher than our cap, so then the 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 actual crediting rate is the cap rate in this example 13 percent. On the way down, and again we're going to discuss protection ways against the way down, but on this example on the way down it's still within the 13 percent positive cap, and again down, and then you get a rebound year, big 34 percent here. The cap uh, limits you to 13 percent. So this is how a cap works. Uh, typically, you're going to have a product um, with either a cap or a par rate. Those are the two most common methods that some that a company will have to kind of limit or control the upside. Uh, the most popular method is is a product that has a cap uh, set at you know um, uh, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, whatever percent, um, and then typically the participation rate is a hundred percent. You get a hundred percent movement. Those that's the most common. Um, index uh, segment design is is some sort of a cap design, and the participation rate is just set at 100%. But there are other examples where you may have no cap and the participation rate is lower. You may have some choices where there's a, a cap that's lower and the participation rate is even higher than 100%. So there's different elements that you can do here. Um, typically, one of these two, either the cap or the uh, par rate, is going to be flexible. And I'm going to get into more about why and and how this comes into uh, pricing in the next session. So here we're just kind of describing terms. Then we get into spread. And spreads, an index spread is a, is a, a little bit newer of an index uh, tool uh, in life insurance and in, in index universal life, but it can be really quite interesting. A spread rate is the difference between the index growth rate and the index crediting rate. So, for example, if the spread were five uh, percent, if the index went up ten, you would subtract the five percent spread and get a five percent credit. If the index went up twenty-five percent, you would subtract the five percent spread and get a twenty percent credit. So this is uh, this is a really interesting design, and it can create some um, uh, some really nice historical look back type of returns. Again, this is declared in advance for each segment. Once the segment starts, the spread rate can't change on them halfway through the measuring period. Um, some index selections um, with spreads have, have no caps. In fact, um, you know, I would say a lot of most uh, index selections that use a spread rate have no cap. Uh, for North Americans, that would be an example as well that has, has no cap. Uh, and the spread rate will not result in a credit below the floor rate. We're going to talk about the floor rate in just a minute, but that means that if you get if the index gets a positive two percent, and the spread is five, it's, it's not going to turn that into a negative three. Um, so, but we'll get into that when we talk about the floor in just a, a little bit. So here's the example. Um, here, again, we've got an example of a, a four percent spread in this case. Uh, if the index goes up eight. The client gets eight minus the four percent spread, which is a positive four. If the index goes up seventeen, they get seventeen minus four, which is thirteen percent. On the downside, it, it, same thing, minus four minus four, and then this huge year, the thirty-four percent at the end. Um, the index goes up thirty-four percent, big rebound. Uh, with a spread index, the client could get thirty-four minus four, a positive thirty percent index credit. Which is kind of interesting, and that 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 makes this a compelling um, index selection is that the idea the idea that you can really participate in some of the large um, upsides. 
which one's better is, is one of the questions that I sometimes get. Um, you can't really say which one's better. Whichever one is easier for the client to understand, the agent to talk about, uh, the, whichever method or index selection that you want. You can look at historical lookbacks if you want, but of course that's not really predictive of, of future performance. So uh, it, it, you could mix and match again. You can choose different index selections and, and which kind of tool that you want, but these are just, they're just different. Uh, and they're generally, uh, you know, priced somewhat similarly neutral. So let's um, look at the floor rate now, because this is really what makes IndexUL so exciting. Uh, it's the idea that we can protect the client from losing money. The idea here is in a, in a down market, zero is my hero. Uh, I'm jumping to the last bullet here. It, the floor is guaranteed to never be less than and 0% on, on North Americans' products and most of the products in the industry. Uh, guaranteed to not be less than 0%, meaning if the index goes down, you can't credit a negative return. So it's a, it's a minimum interest rate used to calculate the index credit. After the par and spread and, and, and cap rates are applied, then they look at the floor rate and say, hey, is it at least 0%? Because if it's not, if it's below zero, then we're going to go ahead and change it and just give them zero. Um, and, and again, the floor rate is declared in advance and can't be changed. Typically, a floor rate on a product doesn't ever change. Ever change. I mean, I guess theoretically, I suppose it could. It could be higher. Uh, but typically, there's a guaranteed floor rate that, that's 0%. And again, um, that uh, uh, typically does not change and certainly can't change during a segment period. So let's look and see our, our theoretical index performance and uh, look at it with a floor. And again, now here I'm ignoring par rates, cap rates or everything and, and just looking at 100% participation rate of, of the underlying index with no cap, no spread, just looking at the floor part of it. And now it looks really interesting, doesn't it? So if the index goes up 8%, the client gets 8%. If it goes up 17, the client gets 17. If it goes down 22 and down 16, the client gets zero. They stay where they are. And then when it goes up 34%, the client gets 34. It's just, it's just a, this would be an awesome design <laughs> if we only had floors and, and had no other uh, upside limitations. This idea of this, um, this minimum return and this kind of a, a ratcheting. Basically, if you look at it here, you've got this annual reset type of thing here, where um, if the index goes down 22%, that's fine. I'm still starting at this 1264 point. If the index goes down 16%, that's fine. I'm still starting at this 1264. So when the index goes up 34, the client can get all that upside. So when you put them all together, let's make an um, imaginary type of thing that that is using uh, uh, a par rate and a cap rate and, and a floor rate. Um, and this is a, a theoretical index that doesn't exist uh, that I'm aware of. I haven't seen this one, but we're just kind of illustrating the point. We have to have a little bit of give and take in these. We have to have, uh, you can't just have a floor with with unlimited upside and no cap and, and, and you know all that stuff. There has to be a way to pay for it. And, and again, we'll get into the ways to pay for it in the next session. But uh, you have to have at least some other element that limits it. In this case, I'm showing actually two elements, a par rate and a cap rate. So if the index goes up 8%, in this example, the client has an 80% participation rate. And is that within the 13% cap? Yeah, it is. Um, so um, we're going to go ahead and get that 80%, which is 6.4%. The next year, the index goes up 17%. So 17 times 0.8 is 13.6, which is actually above the 13% cap. So we have to limit that to 13% growth rate. Uh, and so the client moves up to here. The next year, the index goes down 22%. Um, again, we've got a floor of zero. So our floor rate says, hey, I don't care if the index went down 22, we're going to credit zero. That's what makes index UL so compelling is that you got that protection that you're not going to get a negative interest credit. The next year, uh, index goes down again. Again, we stay where we are. And then this huge bounce back year, um, the, the, we get 80% participation rate, but we're capped at 13, so the client gets a 13% growth rate. This is the general idea of what makes index UL so interesting. Even though the underlying market over this period of time went up and down, and in the end, over a one, two, three, four, five-year period is only up 10.1%. Uh, 
um, over a five year period because of the ups and downs with uh, index designs and with a floor rate and with a cap and par to, to limit the upside, but protect from, from the downside. Uh, we got a five year return in this example, uh, again, without policy charges or anything here uh, of 35.9%. So that's, uh, that's how index UL works. Sometimes it may do in this example, you know, maybe better than the actual underlying market, sometimes worse, uh, but, uh, but that's kind of the idea. Now we're gonna add just uh, um, one more element onto this, and that is uh, just one more term to kind of get you on, on the right uh, page so that we're ready to dig deeper in our next sessions, and that is crediting um, methods and buckets. Uh, or uh, buckets, I also use the word segments. Uh, segments would be another example that you could use for buckets. Uh, when we look at an index um, segment, uh, or an index crediting period or segment, uh, we look at, see, well, how, what ways are we going to measure? What, what different, you know, tools are we going to use? And we talked about some of these terms. Uh, one thing that we offer is an annual point to point, uh, with, uh, a cap. We also have an uncapped, uh, point to point. So we have, uh, basically that's measuring from one year, a point to point type of, uh, method. We're going to look at point A to point B. I used the example earlier. February 6th to February 6th. We'll look at the underlying movement of the market over that period of time and, and then measure that. And, and that may be either, um, there may be a participation rate or a cap or, or, uh, or even this next choice, a spread. Uh, so we also have an index selection that's an annual point to point that has a spread. There, uh, with the spread method, it's, it's uncapped. Uh, so that uh, you can get, for example, in that big 34% year, you could get 34% minus whatever the spread is. We also have a monthly point-to-point. -point. Now, this is interesting. This is still an annual segment. So it's still a one-year measuring period, so to speak, in terms of the floor is applied on a one-year uh, one point. But on the monthly point-to-point, -point, we look at the underlying movement of the index every month and apply a monthly cap. And I'm going to go through an example of that. And then the multi-index annual point-to-point -point, um, goes through and, and measures multiple indexes. So I'm going to go through an example of that, too. So I'm going to go through examples of all of these. Here's the annual point-to-point. Annual point-to-point -point looks at the ending index value minus the beginning index value divided by the beginning index value. So let's say our theoretical index on, on February 6th starts the year at 1,000 um, and then ends the year at uh, 1,100. So we look at 1,100 divided by minus 1,000 is 100 divided by my 1,000, that's 10%. So then I say, okay, that's 10% movement. I apply the participation rate let's say it's 100%, then 100% of 10 is that. Apply the cap and floor rates. Um, and again, the cap is some sort of limit. The floor is the, the bottom side. Add any interest rate bonus if applicable. And then, and then you get the index uh, credit that we're gonna actually apply to the policy. So here's the example. An index goes up, starts at 1,500. Uh, let's say I have $10,000 in the underlying account. The index starts at 1,500. Cap is 13, the par rate is 100, the floor is zero, the interest rate bonus is 0.75. So I'll go through a couple examples. And, and number one, the index um, ends at 2200. Again, I started at 1500. So I, I'm going through line number one here. Um, at, if I'm at 2200 minus 1500, that's a 46% movement. 100% um, participation rate of that is 46 and some percent. Now I have to apply the cap, and again, because if I didn't apply a cap, this would be under the category of too good to be true. There has to be a way to help cover these costs and pay for it. So we got 13% cap, and then I add the interest rate bonus of applicable, and on North American, our, our bonus is 0.75 in years 11 beyond. So in this example there, in years 11 beyond. So we have 13.75% uh, interest rate bonus. In this example, they're getting the credit of 11000 uh, I'm sorry, 1,375 for a total value at the end of the year of 11,375, uh, ignoring policy charges and costs. In, in year two, or the second example, the, the index started at 1,500 and now it's 1,600. So it went up 6.67%. 100% of that is 667. 
that's within our cap and our floor rate, so then that's the amount that's applied to the policy, plus any interest bonus if applicable. And then in the third example, the index goes down. Starts at 1,500, goes down to 1,000. That's a loss of 33%. Um, participation rate of 100% of 33 is a loss of 33, but we apply our floor rate. The floor rate says, hey, we're not gonna credit in a negative return. We're gonna give you a 0%. In fact, if you're in the interest rate bonus period, you're gonna add the bonus on top of that, you get a positive 0.75. So our floor rate is zero on the North American products, essentially for the first 10 years on, for example, our, our builder IUL. Our floor rate is, is zero, uh, but once you're in the interest rate bonus period on an index segment, that, that bonus is contractually guaranteed on index credits uh, in years 11 and beyond. So essentially, you're, you're creating almost a 0.75% floor in years 11 and beyond. So this is how the point-to-point -point works. Do the same thing on point-to-point on -point with spread. We got the, again, the ending value minus the beginning value, the same type of thing. And then we apply our spread rate. Uh, that's the amount that we subtract off the top. Then we look at the floor and add any bonus if applicable, and that's how we determine the interest credit. So let's go through the example here. Again, I'll start with that kind of the same thing. The beginning index value is 1,500, 10,000. We got a 4% spread in this example uh, and a 0% floor. And again, uh, on this product, 100% uh, power rate, no cap. So first example, year one, uh, example one. The index moves uh, to 2,200. That's a 46.67% index movement. I apply the spread rate, which means I subtract 4% off the top. Now we're down to... 42.67%. Uh, that's pretty nice. Uh, so then we apply the floor rate, that's 0%, uh, and then add any interest rate bonus. In this example, 43.42% credited to the policy. Now we'll look at a, a lower example. Uh, here, the index goes up by just 6.67%. Apply the floor rate, now we're down to 2.67. Uh, I'm sorry, apply the power rate, we're down to 2.67. That's still above our floor rate, so the 2.67 is the amount that's credited, plus any interest rate bonus if applicable. And in the third example, when the index goes down, 33% uh, negative return, the par rate would actually bring us down to 37% negative return. But again, the par, uh, that par, I'm sorry, that should say, um, this should say spread rate, not par rate here. So I, I gotta change that next time we do this. So this should say apply spread rate. Um, so it, it, the 37% would be the negative. Um, the floor essentially then uh, comes into play and that's 0%. Um, so we, we, we credit zero or if they're in the interest rate bonus period, we're gonna credit that as well, 0.75. The monthly point to point, as I mentioned, uses a monthly measuring period. So this is just a little bit different in the sense that we kind of repeat this a few times. We look at the change in the underlying index we apply a monthly cap rate, and then we repeat. We go back here for the next month. So we do February, for example, apply the monthly cap rate, find that as our measuring tool, and then we go back and we repeat it again in March and do the same thing over and over 12 times. And after all of that is done, then we look at the participation rate, the floor rate, apply any bonus uh, if applicable. Let's go through an example here. And um, now I got an underlying index that's different 900 um, but but the the uh, cap rate is four percent on the monthly cap and again this is a monthly cap so that don't think that that's a a low number that's a pretty nice number for a monthly cap the par rate is a hundred percent the floor is zero and again the interest rate bonus if applicable so here you have to look at each different month throughout the the year uh, so if we look at month one 925 uh, is where it ended. So we say, well, 925 minus 900, that's a 2.78% change. Is that within our monthly cap of four? Yes. Uh, so then we look at it and we say 2.78, that's our number. Then the next month we say, well, okay, how about 940 is where we finish the second month. 940 minus where the month started, which is the previous month's close, 925. So that's up 1.62. Is that within our 4% cap? Yes. 1.62. The next month it goes down, 1.06. Don't worry, I'm not going through all of them. The next month it goes down, minus 1.06. The minus 1.06 is included. The floor is not yet applied here. 
the monthly numbers do apply a negative here. Now I'm going to jump ahead to uh, an index uh, month in year seven uh, that does a, a large return, 5.95%. Um, my monthly cap comes into play here. 4% is going to limit that monthly movement. So 4% goes in. And then at the end, I'm going to add all of these up uh, and get our growth rate in this example over the 12-month period of 5.68%. The participation rate on, on our monthly point-to-point -point is 100%, so we apply that. Uh, the floor rate, is that above zero? Yes, yes it is. Add any interest rate bonus, and that's how we determine how that's credited. Again, we have... Um, uh, uh, agent guides and consumer guides that will help walk you through these examples as well. And finally, I'm going to talk about the crediting method of the multi-index annual point-to-point. -point. Um, this one, again, does the same thing, measures a one-year period, the movement of an underlying index over a one-year point, but it looks at three different index selections uh, and allocates them uh, retroactively at the end to 50% of the funds essentially being allocated to the highest performing index, 30% of the funds essentially being allocated to the second highest, and 20% of the funds uh, retroactively being allocated to the third highest. The indexes that our multi-index uses are the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, uh, or I'm sorry, the Eurostox 50, it's no longer the Dow Jones Eurostox, the Eurostox 50 and the Russell 2000 uh, rate. Uh, so then we, we allocate essentially after the fact, which is kind of neat, uh, and then apply the participation rate, any cap and floors and, and bonus. Let's go through the example here. Um, in this example, we have 100% participation rate. The cap is a little bit lower on this index selection because, again, we're retroactively weighing in uh, which index, which ones, the one that performs best is the one that retroactively gets more credit. So um, the cap is oftentimes a little bit lower on this selection. So let's say that the S&P 500 uh, started at 1025 and ended at 1225. The Russell went the opposite direction, started at 975, went down. And the Euro stocks uh, started at 2570 and, and went down. So we go in and we, and we allocate them effectively toward their... Um, toward their 50, 30, and 20%. The, the top performing one uh, gets 50%. Um, the, the middle performing one gets 30% allocation, and the bottom performing gets 20%. In this example, the rest of the S&P went up 19.51, 50% allocation gets 9.76. The Russell was the worst performing, 20% allocation gives them a minus 174. The Euro stocks was also poorly performing, but, but not the worst, the second worst. Um, and they get a minus 198, which gives you a total of 6.03 when you average those together. Uh, then we apply the participation rate, which is typically 100%. Doesn't, that does, typically doesn't change. Uh, in, this, in this example, the cap rate might change more frequently. The participation rate doesn't typically change. The cap rate applied, is that within the 10.5? Yes. Uh, add any entry bonus if applicable and, and credit to the policy. Yeah. So that kind of explains, you know, how index, you know, the different crediting methods are done. And then the last uh, section here, I think that we need to talk about, is is the index segment or or bucket. Um, I already kind of mentioned that that's that's the funds that are allocated toward a, a one year period. But you can have multiple segments or multiple buckets for different needs. And, and there's really three different things here going on that that can. Uh, create additional or extra buckets. One thing that we have to think about is the timing of the premium. Um, clients aren't going to put all their funds into a policy all at once in a lump sum and, and never adjust or never make additional premium payments. Um, a lot of times clients are paying monthly premiums or quarterly premiums, uh, not all annual. So we need to consider that. We also need to consider that they might mix and match different index selections. Someone might say, well, gosh, I really like that multi-index selection. Let's put half of it into that and half of it toward the uh, S&P 500 point-to-point. -point. Uh, well, if you put one into one index selection and one into another index selection, well, you're going to need a separate bucket or measuring tool for each one. Uh, and, and there's the, the crediting methods as well. Um, so, you know, we, we've got the, the multi-index has, has one crediting method. Um, and, and let's say that even if your S&P 500 
Um, you may have a crediting method of the S&P 500 point to point, and you may have a crediting method of the S&P 500 uh, point to point with spread. Those are two different crediting methods. One has a cap and one has a spread. And if you have two, even though they're in the same index, um, you need to think about, well, um, those are going to have two different calculation methods and they're, so they're going to have to have different buckets. When you combine these together, that you might have um, two different index crediting methods, you may have different index selections as to which um, indexes that you're in, uh, you may have different timing of, of things. You can have multiple uh, buckets or segments in a life policy earning credits. So they may, uh, you may have five, six, 10, 20, 30, 40. I mean, there could be a number of different buckets in a life policy depending upon um, how the timing has been, how many index selections, how many different index crediting methods that they use. Uh, in the end, uh, on the annual statement, the, the client will get a, a combined uh, type of index credit for each, each month. Uh, but if they wanna get it broken down, they can certainly contact uh, you know, our customer service team and they can help break it down or give them a, a deeper dive or analysis. There's also a, a ability to a access uh, broken down information on our website. The agent can access it or the client can access it and, and find out how each individual segment uh, gets its credits. So um, basically each each segment is a, is a separate bookkeeping entry um, because we need to keep track. They may have different caps and pars. They may have a different starting and ending point. I may put funds in uh, one index uh, segment on February 6th, and on February 20th, I may start another index segment. Um, even though they may overlap by 50 of the 52 weeks of the year, um, they're going to get slightly different index credits because of the timing. Um, we're going to continually check uh, at lapse and, and surrender uh, on all of these buckets. We're going to continually be um, crediting and, and, and applying index credits throughout the, the period. Um, we also have a, a, a minimum. I'm sorry, this is really talking about minimum. I, I was kind of going off onto additional things here. Minimum account value. Um, minimum account value is the minimum. Sorry, I. I Gosh, I wish I could just rewind this. Uh, minimum account value is the minimum return that you can get uh, on an index um, credit uh, over the uh, the life of a policy. So, minimum account value is the idea that you get um, uh, a two and a half percent, for example, minimum return over the life of the product. So, we'll keep a separate bookkeeping entry uh, as to what would the policy be doing if it earned an annualized rate of return as if the money were in the fixed account earning uh, two and a half percent over the policy duration. What would the actual account value be? And then we'll compare that uh, to the actual account value in the policy. Uh, and we will continually check that at lapse or surrender. Uh, if the policy is surrendered at any time or if it's in danger of lapsing or at death, uh, we will check and see what would the account value be if it got the minimum return, the two and a half percent is our, is our current uh, minimum account value return, what would it be um, if they had received a two and a half percent return in the fixed account since policy inception? Uh, and then the client will get the greater of their actual index uh, credits and account value or the minimum two and a half percent annualized rate of return. Every 10 years, we will true that up in the policy. So we'll look every 10 years and say, okay, now here we are 10 years into the policy. What is their current account value? What's the minimum account alternate account value? And the client will get the bigger of those two. Uh, there's, there's not a reset. So at the end of the 10 year period, do we start over with a new reset? No, the, the minimum account value is since the inception of the policy. Uh, so uh, that uh, hopefully uh, will not come into play for anybody, but uh, it is a nice little extra peace of mind in knowing that there is some sort of uh, a minimum amount. Um, in, in summary, and then I'll go through and I'll address some questions that people have here. Uh, in, in summary, we talked a little bit about the account options, uh, some of the different uh, ways that, that you can al allocate funds into the fixed account or indexed account. We, we talked about some terms. Uh, we talked about cap rates, par rates, uh, floor and spread rates. These are terms that you're going to be seeing uh, quite commonly in Index Universal Life and are really going to help set the table for our more detailed discussion next week about how life insurance companies really 
provide these credits? How does this really work? What's the mechanics behind it? And, and then we're going to talk a little bit. We talked about the crediting methods and, and the buckets. Uh, and we also talked about the minimum account value. Uh, some, some different uh, understanding that timing and choices between your different segments or your account options are going to create multiple measuring buckets. Uh, and in the end, they're all lumped together uh, for the client's actual performance. You know, so the bottom bottom line for all indexed universal life products really is that that indexed universal life provides some some flexibility uh, in terms of not only the all the flexibility that universal life provides, but it also provides different options for cash accumulation as opposed to just a fixed interest rate, especially in in a fixed interest rate environment that's not too thrilling. Uh, it provides different options for cash accumulation, knowing of course that if you want. You can always go back and, and allocate to the fixed account if you'd like. Uh, you as the agent, you get an, hopefully you're going to get a better understanding here of really the mechanics of what IUL is uh, and, and recognize that there are resources here available to you. We have a lot of different agent guides and marketing guides and, and tools. And of course, you have our, our team here uh, at North American that can help you uh, better understand this as well. Hopefully, this is the first uh, step of a multi-stage process of getting really comfortable with Index Universal Life so that you can uh, take it on to the next level and really uh, vault your Index UL sales in 2018 and beyond. So I'd say familiarize yourself with North American's IUL. And then uh, once you're through this session, the, the or as you get more familiar and, and get what you need, start thinking about contacts. Start start identifying people that you're going to reach out and, and talk to about Index UL, especially if you have not done much of this in the past. Uh, you know, pick five that you're going to uh, work with and 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 start there, uh, and then use North American uh, as a as a tool, as a company, uh, and as a product solution to meet these needs.